Here is a plot of the temperature fluctuations. Tc is the average temperature in the center of probes. T is the temperature measured. Uh, delta C is, as you recall, the room mean square temperature fluctuation in the center of probe. So here we're plotting temperature deviation from average value normalized by its root mean square. And here we are plotting the probability of observing this temperature fluctuation. So this is a kind of histogram. How often do, does it happen that the temperature fluctuation in dimensionless units has this value? The probability plotted here answers how often it is that that occurs. And this is a plot which is done for four different heating rates, ranging between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 12. As you can see, the pattern you get for the lower heating rate or the higher heating rate is exactly the same. All of the results, well, the results you see are the same at the beginning of hard turbulence or as hard as we can push the experiment. The conclusion I wish you, therefore, to reach is that something simple is going on which is repeated again and again at all of the different Raleigh numbers. I'm going to finish up this description of the, uh, of the uh, simple part of the experiment by talking about a power spectrum. The power spectrum is the Fourier transform of the temperature signal. Here is the Fourier transform squared, plotted as a function of frequency. There, I want you to notice that there's a sharp bump in that. That's an indication there's some kind of oscillation going on at that frequency. And the last thing, the last experimental curve I want to show you is a plot of the peak frequency made dimensionless by multiplying by the size of the system squared and dividing by kappa as a function of Raleigh number. Again, over these four plus decades, there's a nice straight line fit at which all the different fillings fall on the same straight line. Simple results. Now it is time for us to start to develop a little bit of theoretical understanding of this. Well, I should point out to you that the problem of turbulence, which is the essential problem here, is a problem which has been worked on uh, for 100 years, uh, that major advances were made by Kolmogorov and Heisenberg and Ansager in the period around the Second World War, and then the field got a little stuck. Uh, but we'll be brave and at least try to analyze the experiment and try to, to describe what is going on. Uh, I think the audience is not so big that I couldn't answer questions. Please, if I've gotten you confused or you have some questions about something, please ask away and uh, I will turn you off. When I yes, sir. This is the, I showed you a picture of a tank of water. Everything else I've shown you data taken from that cylinder. The reason the, the reason it's a cylinder is that it fits in the door nicely. Uh, the reason it's done at five degrees Kelvin is that basically it's a low noise environment which is isolated from the outside world. And uh, they uh, they're very proud of the low noise they see with the thermometers. Okay. Here is a theorist picture of what's going on. Uh, this cartoon picture involves a, a swirly flow in the center region, a boundary layer in which the major temperature change is supposed to occur. The big temperature drop, it will drop over the entire cylinder, over the entire region from bottom to top is delta. However, the, there's a temperature difference very close to delta over two across this boundary layer and ditto across that boundary layer. And then there's some kind of mixing zone which interpolates between the boundary layers and the central region. Here comes the theory, guys. Let's see what it is. Well, it's something that uh, uh, we could uh, present with only, uh, you'll see what it is. It's, uh, it's not very fancy at all. What I'm going to say is that there's, uh, first I'm going to look at the central region. The central region I'm going to imagine hot droplet. And I'm going to say that this droplet has typical temperature difference to the environment of the central region, delta C, and typical
typical velocity you see. I'm going to imagine that there's a typical kinetic energy per unit mass, which is uc squared over 2. This is almost the last time you'll see a 2 in any of my arguments. Exponents I will keep. However, three factors of 2 I will argue away. Uh, potential energy is the potential energy produced by gravity, g times the expansion coefficient times delta c times the height of the cavity. That is, that's the potential energy you gain by moving from the bottom to the top. And then I am going to say, let us assume that uh, the potential energy can be converted into kinetic energy. And to an order of magnitude, you see the velocity is uh, given by setting kinetic energy potential equal to kinetic energy equal to potential energy, and say to an order of magnitude, u c is an order g alpha delta c l to the one half power. Once I've got that, I can estimate the flux of heat upward. That flux is the temperature difference carried by these little hot droplets times the velocity at which they move. So we get h, the heat flux is u c times delta c. This kind of hand waving argument is going to be used to set the orders of magnitude of things. And then we're going to come back and see whether that hand waving argument is uh, justified by the experimental data. So I've done now the central region. I've finished with this part of the cell. And now I'm moving into a boundary layer. There's a hot, thin boundary layer. Here. Uh, there's a cold thin boundary layer at the top and a hot thin layer boundary layer at the bottom. And I'm not going to do anything more complicated in the boundary layer. I'm going to say in this narrow region, heat conduction is what carries everything, that we have a width of the region much less than the size of the system, and that the heat flow is by conduction. Heat flow is thermal conductivity, temperature difference across the boundary layer, which is the same order as the temperature difference across the system divided by lambda, the width of the boundary layer. We've got half the theory. Other half. I need to do the mixing zone, the region that interpolates between the boundary layer here and the central region up there. And I'm going to now visualize what occurs in that mixing zone. That visualization is, I'm going to imagine that the boundary layer comes up in pieces and moves up to the top of the mixing zone and breaks up. This boundary layer contains hot light fluid. It wants to move up, but it's going to stick together and it moves up in pieces like this, in my view, and breaks up into uh, droplets, which then fused into the central region. Uh, after I drew this picture, and I had some trepidations about the picture, because uh, I was a little worried about whether the view of the mixing zone was right, I realized that uh, I could see my fears in the picture. This looks like the midnight horror movie with hands coming out of the grave. Well, uh, this is where I'm worried about the theory, so that's OK. Here, here's the theory that goes with that. In the mixing zone, we say that the widths of the hot sheets are lambda. But the temperature difference is of the order of the temperature differences in the boundary layer or delta. But the typical speeds are the speeds reached in the central region called UC. In this way, we estimate the size of the things. Well, what do we mean? What I really mean is that I'm going to balance the viscous force on the droplet against the buoyancy pushing it up. 
then combine this equation with this equation and this equation and that one, and we're done. And we get results. Let me quote what the results are. The results are that the Nusselt number, the dimensionless measure of the heat flow, is uh, proportional to the Rayleigh number to the 2 seventh power. The delta C over delta is proportional to the Rayleigh number to the minus 1 seventh power. And then UC expressed in dimensionless form. That's the velocity. This is a temperature fluctuation in the central region. is proportional to the Rayleigh number to the 3 seventh power. Uh, by arguing a little bit more and waving one's hands around a little bit faster, one gets an estimate of the, of the, lot, of the frequency of oscillation. However, that uh, estimate is uh, even less compelling than the estimates I have made so far. Now let me show you the comparison between the theory and the experiment. I am frankly rather embarrassed by it. These, uh, the theory and the experiment compare far too well. The Nusselt number in the experiment goes as the 0.282 plus or minus 0.006 power of the Rayleigh number. The Nusselt number is Rayleigh number raised to this power in the experiment. This is a uh, uh, this is a statistical error. We do not know what our actual systematic errors are. What you mean by statistical error is that if you choose a two uh, scientists at random and ask them to, ask to uh, draw graphs and get slope off of those two graphs, this is the, dip, the typical difference they will have in the values they uh, get off of the graphs. That does not say that the experiment is well designed or badly designed or that what the systematic errors are. The reason that the numbers is embarrassing is that the uh, 2 seven, which is the theoretical value, is 0.2828 and so forth, some stuff after that. And uh, that's just too good a fit. Uh, but uh, there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in fact, the Nusselt number has been measured by other people long before our group got to it. And this is the kind of typical value that was measured by other people. Delta C over delta, we, the theory was minus the seventh power. Experimental value is this one again too good to be true. You see, it's been measured by a Japanese group, Tanaka and Miyata. And the the you see times L over nu went as a Raleigh number to the point four three power according to them, and we got three sevenths, which we didn't get exactly four four three. Now. I have described for you what is apparently a correct description of the order of magnitude of things. Next, it is time to look more carefully into the experiment, see whether, in fact, what the experiment talks about is realized in <coughs> nature, and to look in more detail at what is going on. First, let me tell you that uh, as uh, you almost all know, a lot's known about heat transfer. For example, in Van Dyke's book, An Album of Fluid Motion, there are beautiful pictures of what happens when you have a hot surface. The hot surface produces what are called the thermal plumes. Heat comes up this narrow stalk, hot fluid comes up the narrow stalk, enters to the head of the mushroom. This mushroom is moving ahead, and there is a Swirling stuff in the corner produced by what vortices exist in the corner of this. We have all seen a, a frightening version of this in the mushroom clouds produced in nuclear explosions. This is the same thing, small. If you heat, have higher heating rates, the same basic thing goes on. They look a little bit more ragged. Now, my colleagues took a better look at their water tank system. You can't look into the helium system. First of all, it's hard to put windows in the door. And secondly, even if you do put windows in the door, uh, you, uh, when you look in, uh, you discover that helium has a small temperature dependence of index of contraction. I think I've got to look at the slides next. Uh, helium has a small uh, temperature dependence of the index of refraction. And uh, that uh, small temperature dependence makes it hard to see things. But my colleague
and the spray comes up and forms this mushroom cloud. That's what's going on then. Waves are moving across. Those waves are carrying with them plumes and forming plumes. I will have two more pictures of waves to show you, and then I come back uh, to, uh, to the rest of the slide. Here is a pattern of waves moving across the bottom of the sand. What you're seeing here is the bottom of the sand. These lines, the black lines moving across that way, are interference fringes on a laser light. They're just artifacts enabling you to see the bumps. These bumps are waves moving across the tank from left to right. This is a smaller heating rate. As the heating rate gets larger, the waves get higher and start to break. These breaking waves contain on them plumes, and those plumes are carrying heat up into the system. So now I can draw you a picture of what's going on in the system. This is a cartoon somewhat similar to, but different from, the uh, cartoon that I drew at the beginning of the talk. The first cartoon I drew was a theory unsupported by visualizations. Now this is theory as informed by visualization. There are waves moving along the bottom of the tank, attached to the top of those waves of plumes. There's a boundary layer, and these plumes exist in a mixing zone. Along the sides, there's a rather rapid motion that we might call a jet stream, a jet up on one side, down on the other. There's an overall swirling motion. Plumes come loose and move through the center of the system. And that's what this is. Now, I have a conceptual question to ask. Lots 
and lots of different behaviors. They have enough in the way of large parameters or small <coughs> parameters to produce beautiful structures. And they make these structures of this level of unity. In fact, this is a quite a remarkable thing, in my opinion. And I will finish up with that. Here we have nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing but a set of uh, differential equations, partial differential equations. Uh, the system forms different regions, lots of them. Each region can be described. Uh, each region can be described by simple laws. For example, there's a simple power law. The system we're talking about shows a combination of extreme complexity in the details of its flow pattern and extreme simplicity in the statistical laws like the one I described here. <coughs> Maybe the lesson we should learn from this experiment with a pot heated from below is that hydrodynamic systems will form beautiful structures containing at one and the same time simplicity and complexity. That as nature works out its laws in <coughs> situations in which it has the option of doing lots of things, but there will be some lovely simple stuff, some complicated stuff, some possibility of describing things by statistical laws. And it's interesting to look at this, because of course we are the result of nature also. We are the result of the working out of natural law. Perhaps we too 